the Go Lightly Marshall Hour on freedomtalkradio.net. Yes, that's because I brought it over closer. Ah. Mm. The Hindu prophecy is the ancient prophecies of the Essenes because it was given to them and the um, Vedas means angels. So the angels gave it to them. And uh, the angels were the same angels that built all these marvellous things all throughout India and Africa and all around the world, um, primarily um, to drive uh, the future Jews nuts because they're going to be a representative of the evil that's uh, been collected um, from the fallen angels that made it with women, with giants in the old days and blah, blah. So the flood came along and killed off everybody on the earth that was similar to the earth today. Uh, you've got uh, the Sodom and Gomorrah effect going in. You've got a, uh, the uh, Obama, who was a homosexual, passing all laws, making legal marriages throughout every state in the United States. Um, so it's the was, whole LGBT agenda all over again. It's all, what Sodom, it's and all Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, here's Michelle Obama, who is actually a, a man. Um, the uh, the sad thing about it all is is that the uh, Obama himself is a skull and bonesman. They admittedly worship the devil. Uh, for some obscure reason, uh, I can't get my head around it. Why Americans would would even go along with? Uh, having any laws. It's called fluoride. Well, maybe. But, I mean, freedom of religion laws. I mean, that means you can be a prime minister in a country like Australia if you uh, eat babies' heads on Sundays. So uh, in uh, America, they've got this devil worship, and uh, it's full-blown. Well, it's it's known it, that well, 10% it, of the population are um, well, that is Satanists. Right. But, but more so than that, um, every position of power in America is a skull and bonesman. Hmm. Now, England, when it uh, has its ships come back to port, flies a skull and bones. So they go, what's that all about? Well, it's all the same thing. However, um, you've got the protocols of Zion, we will forbid Christ. I mean, that's another stupid move. Um, if... Uh, we look into the Protocols of Zion, it points out quite clearly what they think of you. In the Talmud, uh, it says that if uh, the Goy, which is the white person, uh, finds out what the Jews say about you, uh, you'd be on the streets and you'd kill them openly. I think it's a bloody good idea myself. But um, if, for example... uh, Hitler had won the war, you wouldn't have the problems of the people in America in particular being slaughtered by injection. Your babies, how you mothers allow your babies to have a vaccination. I mean, I'm quite mortified. Just to see a baby having a vaccination is is beyond me. How uh, I never had my kids vaccinated. If they were, it wasn't... I'd had no idea about it. Of course, I was married to the devil, so who knows... Uh, but um, what's happening today is quite extraordinary. Uh, we've just gone to Nehemiah, which is uh, at approximately 70 degrees south latitude uh, by 9 degrees uh, west longitude. Basically, if you go straight out of uh, uh, Australia, straight down, you hit Antarctica. And uh, if you have another line coming out of South America, where those two intersect, it's at 70 degrees, you've got Nehemiah. That's approximately where it is. So it's not out of line, on the coast. The distance from Nehemiah to uh, where I was reborn is Rabboni, which means Lord, Master. And it's only found once in the Bible, and uh, we're putting up a a, uh, YouTube. It'll show you exactly where it is because I've done all these drawings. But moreover, um, I've been saying to you for the longest of times that uh, we crossed the Milky Way galaxy on uh, the 11th of December 2011 and at 11.11am Eastern Australian time we took movies of the moon the moon flipped upside down in one hour went 180 degrees which is not a bad effort uh, when I predicted it if you go to your sink and fill it with water make sure the water is still 
and then slowly drain the water out. And I suggest the easiest way to do that is get an old CD and put it over the plug hole and put a bit of paper or something on that, stop the water going out, fill it, then sprinkle something that'll float on top when the water is not turning. Put a knife down, a nice sharp point, and pull that piece of cardboard or whatever you got over the hole in the CD or the DVD and the water will slowly drain out through it. And as it's draining out, it's going to start to rotate, as you know. But if you're in North America and Europe, it's going to rotate backwards from what it used to do. It is going to go anti or counter clockwise. Now that you're in Australia, it goes clockwise. Well, we was doing tests daily for months, and uh, it was pinpointing the date that uh, when you go across the equator, the uh, rotation has ceased, and um, we have it on film where uh, the water just drains straight down without turning left or right. So this is what uh, I was predicting, and then, of course, I was right. It was am. So the Satanists are getting a bit, bit uh, cautious because on the 27th of this month, the ancient Hindi's astrology, which is correct, that had predicted that Yahweh... Jehovah would come to the earth and be crucified as a man, born of a virgin, everything that, that happened in your Bible, everything that the Muslims deny is true, and therefore uh, it's God in the flesh. Now, before I get to the point of what I'm trying to tell you, I want you to understand that when death on the cross occurred, the soul is in the blood. And as the blood poured out, the body was left lifeless, but the blood was still alive. So death on the cross of the flesh is one thing. You can't kill the soul because it's got inside the blood of Jesus. So when the resurrection occurred, the shroud was placed over the body because of the constraints of time. Uh, you're not allowed to entomb or embalm a person after the 6 o'clock because this is a, the, the date of the next Sabbath or the next night at 6 p.m. That's when the day started, you might say. So the tomb was locked up. Then when the resurrection occurred, the soul came back backwards. So if you can imagine you're standing or you're hanging on a cross, and you were to step out of your body, which way do you step out? Forward. Okay? So the spear is on the left-hand side. That's where your heart is. When the soul came back into the Shroud of Turin and the body beneath it, it left the imprint on the outside of the Shroud. So all these fools that are looking at the Shroud are looking at the inside of it thinking that's the inside of it against the body, when in fact it's the other way around. It was draped over the body and the soul came in. As it went out, forward, it came back in backwards. So the spear is left on the left side, but because people who are scientists looking at these things are pretty dumb and uh, there's no original thought really. It's just like uh, chickens running around pecking here and there for bits of information. I give them the information how it all happened because they don't want to know, do they? Why? Because it's all controlled by the same monsters, the same Jews. Uh, one of the uh, most, in, in, uh, what's the word, intensive uh, work is done by a Jew, a photographer who was there. And uh, I've written to him on numerous occasions. doesn't make any damn difference. Never answers. So whether he gets it or not doesn't matter. The Jews are stopping any communications. Now... Let's get to the important bit. Looking at Nehemiah, now Nehemiah is a live feed in the sense that it takes a snapshot of from a, uh, a camera, a webcam, every 10 minutes for a 24-hour period. And at this time of year, the uh, earth being tilted the way it is, under normal circumstances at 23.5 degrees. At this time of year, there is no sunlight. The sun does not rise above the 60 degree latitude. 
This is like a line of demarcation. But Nehemiah is at 70 degrees. So what happens is there's a period of time in the summer when the sun will come up and it'll be above. Let's say you're standing on the South Pole. The sun will go around the equator and not set. Likewise, during the winter months, the sun does not come up above the horizon. Well, that is that time of year now. So, when we go to Nehemiah and have a look at the live webcam, the sun, or something, is coming up for an eight-hour or nine-hour period. And as bright as can be. But you don't see the normal sunrise and sunset. So what's happening? The moon is over Antarctica. And so being a giant reflector in the sky, it is reflecting light down onto Nehemiah and you can see that the light is from uh, 8 in the morning approximately. So what time was it in the evening it goes out? Do you remember? Uh, 1700. 1700. <coughs> So you got from 8 to 1,700. You've got a nine-hour period. I think I said that already. Yes. Right? All right, so you've got a nine-hour period when it's bright sunlight. But is it sunlight or is it reflected moonlight? Well, in fact, you can look at it by studying the, the period of time that the, uh, uh, what is above. It's not the sun going around and casting shadows in all directions. The shadows remain the same because the moon is above, or in this case, below Antarctica. So if you're down and you're in Nehemiah and you're watching the webcam where it should be dark for 24 hours straight, it's not. It all of a sudden becomes from 8 to 8.10 to 8.20 going in 10 minute increments as it goes from pitch black to bright much faster than you would expect from a sunrise to sunset period. Well, that's the wrong time of year. But what's happened is when we was in England, and one of the reasons we were in England, um, we was observing that the sun would come up in the east, go around over where we were, and then almost straight up at noon, and then turn and come back around from the west, and then continue and set in the east, and joining up with a complete circle because the earth has tilted over at that time, I estimate it to be around 40 degrees. So it's continued to do so. No one's talking about it, of course. And that is why you can get up in the morning and say, geez, that doesn't seem right, the sun's in the wrong spot, or it's setting in the wrong spot, or the moon's coming up in the wrong spot. Of course it is. It's because it's the earth has tilted over and it's probably more like 50 degrees on its side now because we're in the northern hemisphere of the Milky Way galaxy and it has a north and south pole. So as we go over the and further north as the progression of the movement at 69,000 kilometres per hour, it keeps on heading north, then the Earth itself will turn over upside down slowly because we're only moving at a slow speed. 69,000 kilometres an hour is nothing compared to celestial bodies. But the moon is in its regular orbit to a certain extent. It's certainly it's shifted off its orbit as well. But it is still, like the other planets, going around and around in the same orbital plane. But because of the magnetic field of the Earth, it is now flipping upside down so that the north and south pole will align with the north and south pole or the opposite south and north pole of the Milky Way galaxy. So we're slowly turning upside down. That's what's causing all your weather to be strange. So you'll be able to go and pull the, uh, the plug out, watch the water go down, and it's going to go the wrong way if you're in the northern hemisphere. Right? In fact, you can go online and you can see in Africa, you can go to some of the... Uh, displays that these Africans have they, they have a, a pail of water and a couple of flowers they sprinkle on top <clears throat> and then there's a line there which is on the equator so tourists come in, oh whoopee and they have a look at this and the Africans will walk one or two feet a couple of metres south and the water will pour 
and it'll go in one direction. Then they'll do the same thing. Look at this, missus, and walk across to the other side and pour it out again and drain the water out and the flower will go around and around and around the wrong direction or the opposite direction. Then you go forward, let's say, say from 2005 onwards, you can still find them there. Go to the most recent ones. Now the Africans ain't saying nothing because they're, they're as dumb as pig shit. All of a sudden, it's going the other way. They're not saying to any of the tourists, oh, if you'd have been here in 2005, the water was going the other direction. They're not saying that. They're saying nothing. They're probably too dumb to even realise it themselves. They say, got up one morning and it's going the other direction. Oh, well. Musa, what happened yesterday? I don't know. And that's how, because I've worked with Africans. They're as thick as two short planks, right? And they would never even realise why it's happening. They just get, go on take a few dollars off their, their little, uh, little scam they got going. So we have now uh, the ability to go to Nehemiah, look at the live webcam. We've done a film of it. We're uploading it at the moment at the Golightly Marshall channel. It's going to be uploaded at the uh, other channels we've got. And then you can send it around uh, to anywhere you want and use it, whatever. But it should show you without any shadow of a doubt that he, once again, I'm telling you the truth, and once again, no one's talking about it. Why? Because Protocol 14, we will forbid Christ. I would also suggest you go to Wikipedia and try to put my name in there as being a false Christ with all the other false Christs. And it'll last about 20 minutes. What's the, what's the record we have now? Oh, 45. 45 record. minutes is as long as it's lasted mm -hmm. until they get onto it and then remove it. So if I was a false Christ, they should have me up there, shouldn't they? Surely. Well, they don't want me up there. And the reason they don't want me up there is because someone will see the name and they're going to start searching it out and not these other lunatics which say, oh, I'm Jesus because my mother told me. Oh, fuck, that's a good idea. Maybe I should have said that. Right? Never, never gone into it proving it, right? I'd be still up there if that was the case. But no, the reality is that they don't want you to know, even in a denial sense. They don't want to talk about me big time. Mm. That's their way of handling you, That's is right. to ignore you completely. Now, I measured from Nehemiah to uh, where I was born, and it is the distance is Raboni. I then measured from the South Pole, and uh, for any of you who are familiar with the, what we're talking about, the distance to where I was born, same point, is uh, the Comforter. And the Comforter, of course, is the Lord coming back. It's not Jesus, it's the soul of Jesus which was the father so it's the father coming back to judge the world so that's it's called a comforter so it's not Jesus so if anyone says Jesus is going back it's bullshit it's not happening alright so what have we got we got the comforter one direction from Nehemiah is Rabboni the Lord right so then you join the three up and you have a an area within three sides you've got a line from the south pole to Nehemiah a line from Nehemiah to where I was born or raised for 942 days, back down to the South Pole, the area within it and the distance around those four sides tells you it's Queen Elizabeth is going to be removed and utterly destroyed and forgotten. Queen Elizabeth, because she's sitting on my throne. Her father told her when she was a child, when Christ shows up, hand it over. Now, he was a Freemason, all right, but he had a fair idea what his, his true uh, job was, to hand it over to Christ, because he probably didn't realise that Christ was not going to be a Freemason. However, she knows damn well because she's been served twice, and uh, she knows exactly and precisely who I am. So, apart from that, it's been a slow day. Hmm. There's a kookaburra sitting on the fence. He laughs at me too, that little bastard, too. <laughs> Love, kookaburra, love. Kookaburra. The funny thing is, you see all the African movies of Jungle Jim and Tarzan in the old days, it's always a kookaburra in the background. With his laugh, you know, the laugh of a kookaburra. Mm. Anyhow, is there anything more to say, darling? Or you've had enough no, of I'm just going to tweet Elizabeth the good news. <laughs> all right, before you do that, do something that the people can hear on the radio. Oh. Because we're on the radio, right? I know. <laughs> well, I could start typing the tweet. Don't do that. <laughs> you can read something that uh, is important, which you said you were going to, the Nihilist Report, or one of those. 
No, that no, that that's another show all on its own. That's the Donald Scott. You could paper read the Nihilist report because we've got half hour to go. Okay. <laughs> oh yes, Nihilus. Nihilus. Searching, searching, searching. Here we go. There's a magic about computers, even though they are hacked. Um, the beauty of it is, you, when when they go in and hack them, we see what their problem is. Right? And then you can just go in and hone real deep. Right? It's like they open up a wound by what they remove. And uh, in doing that, you know where their sensitive spot is. And of course, you just go after them like a, uh, an eagle after a piece of red meat. All right, so we've got um, approximately 40 minutes. So this is The Truth About the Protocols by General B. Winrod, editor of The Defender. And then the contents of it are... The book, The Time of the Awakening, Ginsburg, Nihilus. Uh, I'll just start reading. So while she's reading that, just remember the known as our granddaughter. <laughs> yeah. Go to Nehemiah and have a look. After N-E-U- N-E-U-M-E-Y-E-R. Oh, I was going to say that. Were you, babe? Mm. <laughs> Okay, after observing the title of this book, some will accuse me of being anti Semitic. If. Really? What? He doesn't like the Jew bastards either. Wow, well, Hansi some anti Semitic. Look, he's already apologising to the evil bastards before he starts, right? Some will accuse me after. Yeah, well, anyway, if by this they mean that I am. Are we listening? What? What I was just it? reading for what how Tesla called Einstein a long head crank. <laughs> well, he was. All right, okay, here we go again. This is Winrod. Now, this Nihilus was written, what, 1905? Early 1900s. After observing the title of this book, some will accuse me of being anti Semitic. If by this they mean that I am opposed to the Jews as a race or as a religion, I deny the allegation. But if they mean that I am opposed to a coterie of international Jewish bankers ruling the Gentile world by the power of gold, if they mean that I am opposed to international Jewish communism, then I plead guilty to the charge. So the book, on the shelves of the British Museum in the City of London, there is a book in the Russian language by Sergius a nihilus called the protocols of the wise men of zion it contains 24 documents which purport to reveal the inner workings of a plot by certain international jewish leaders to enslave the world through a dictatorship based upon the power of gold next to the bible this volume translated into various languages is perhaps the most widely read book in existence the superintendent of the library told me that he constantly receives inquiries about it from all parts of the world. Its catalogue mark in the library is C37.C.31. This book was received by the museum August the 10th, 1906. It was purchased through regular trade channels and there was nothing extraordinary about the manner in which it reached England's greatest library. The first translation from the Russian into English was published by Eyre and Spottiswood, official printers of the British government in 1920. Victor E. Marsden, who had previously represented a London newspaper in Russia, made another translation about the same time. Because Mr. Marsden was a master in both languages, His work is generally regarded as being thoroughly accurate and dependable. He lived through the Russian Revolution and was forced to spend considerable time in a Bolshevik prison. Injuries thus sustained impaired his health and sent him back home a broken man. Later, he accompanied the Prince of Wales on his tour of the British Empire but died suddenly afterwards. Nihilus first published the protocols in 1905, although they had come into his hands four years before. 
He regarded it a patriotic and religious duty to give them the widest possible circulation. From the beginning of the century down to the present hour, the plot which these documents disclose has been fulfilled step by step. In them we see an advance unfoldment of the economic and political history of the nations. If the protocols are forgeries, as some Jews assert, then it is a paradox that everything which they outline should be coming to pass before our eyes. So here we are 110 years later, and still we see the protocols coming to pass before our eyes. However, it is to their end. We are glad We rejoice in the days ahead. So the Talmud, where did the protocols originate? It is necessary to examine this problem from three angles in order to arrive at a satisfactory answer to this question. First, the secret operations of ancient Jewish kahal must be understood. Second, the rebirth of Jewish nationalism involving the building of Zionism and communism must be studied. Third, the source from which Nihilus claimed to have received the documents must be considered. Turning to the Encyclopedia Britannica, we find such phrases as hidden doctrines, hidden wisdom and mystic communion used in discussing the mysterious nature and purpose of the Kahal. We are told that the germ of this organisation may be traced to sayings and beliefs mentioned in the Talmud and known to have existed among the Gnostics. In my book, Adam Weishaupt, A Human Devil, we trace the vicious trail of Gnosticism from the beginning of the Christian era through the centuries into occult illuminism and finally into modern Bolshevism. For this reason, we will not dwell on the subject here, but because of the intimate relation between the Kahal and the Talmud, it becomes necessary to consider certain succinct features of the latter at this time. It is exceedingly difficult to secure even extracts from the Talmud in the English language. So well have Jewish leaders succeeded in keeping these writings away from the Gentiles. In her discussion of subversive movements, Mrs. Nestor Webster of England offers several quotations from the Talmud, which include such statements as, quote, kill the best of the Gentiles and... Tradition tells us that the best of the Gentiles deserve death. Graetz, a writer on Jewish history, speaks of a converted Jew and former student of the Talmud by the name of Donin, who, after his baptism in the 13th century, brought charges against the Talmud, saying that it was filled with abuse against the founder of the Christian religion. Donan demonstrated that it was the Talmud which prevented the Jews from accepting Christianity and that without it they would certainly have abandoned their state of unbelief. He stated that the Talmudical writing taught it was a meritorious action to kill the best man among the Christians, that it was lawful to deceive a Christian without any scruple. What stronger argument for the authenticity of such quotations from the Talmud is needed than to contemplate the solemn fact that exactly this kind of a program of destruction is being carried out, particularly in Russia, where the orgy of killing has resulted in the slaying of millions of Gentile Christians. Lady Queen Borough says in her treatise Occult Theocracy, quoting the obligations and rules of the right for the Jewish masses are contained in the Talmud and Shulchan Aruch, but the esoteric teachings for the higher initiates 
are found to be in the Kabbalah. Therein are contained the mysterious rites for evocations, the indications and keys to practices for conjuration of supernatural forces, the science of numbers, astrology, etc. So this is all a continuation from Solomon, who used to conjure the demons. Continuing, the practical application of the Kabbalist knowledge is manifested in the use made of it through the ages by Jews to gain influence both in the higher spheres of Gentile life and over the masses. Sovereigns and popes both usually had one or more Jews as astrologers and advisors, and they frequently gave Jews control over their very life by employing them as physicians. Political power was thus gained by Jews in almost every Gentile country alongside with financial power, since Jewish court bankers manipulated state funds and taxes. With its benign breath, Supreme Council as the directing head, the sect with its members swarming among all nations has become the sovereign power ruling in the council of all nations and governing their political, economic, religious and educational policies. In exposing the nest of occultism which evil birds have built in the branches of Judaism, General Nechvalodov says in his book Nicholas et les Uifs, the Chaldean science acquired by many of the Jewish priests during the captivity of Babylon gave birth to the sect of the Pharisees whose names appear in the Holy Scriptures and in the writings of the Jewish historians after the captivity in 606 BC. This is what Yahweh has been telling the world for decades now. It's the Babylonian Pharisee priests who came out of the captivity. The work of the celebrated scientist Monk leaves no doubt on the point that the sect appeared during the period of the captivity. Quoting, From then dates the Kabbalah or tradition of the Pharisees For a long time their precepts were only transmitted orally, but later they formed the Talmud and received their final form in the book called the Zephyr HaZohar. It was to this occult circle of heartless monsters that Jesus Christ addressed his powerful polemics, quoting, Ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell. Ye are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. I just want you to think about all of the rabbis today throughout Israel and around the world. Netanyahu, as you hear those words that Yahweh spoke as Jesus To be fulfilled today, the condemnation of hell is um, from tomorrow onward. And Netanyahu has indeed been warned. There is no escape for him. It doesn't matter what he does. He, uh, He and all like him. You've heard the judgment. No Jew will inherit the kingdom of God. Beyond doubt, this ring of conspirators was responsible for both the death of Christ and much of the persecution which the early church suffered. Flavian Brenier, a recognised authority on the subject of Judaism, explains how the secret lodge of Pharisees attained their great power in Israel and succeeded in perverting the nation's leadership from spiritual ideals to physical channels. 
he says, quote, this group of intellectual pantheists was soon to acquire a directing influence over the Jewish nation. Nothing, moreover, likely to offend national sentiment ever appeared in their doctrines, however saturated with pantheistic Chaldeism they might have been. The Pharisees preserved their ethnic pride intact. This religion of man, divinized, which they had absorbed at Babylon, they conceived solely as applying to the prophet of the Jew, the superior and predestined being. The promises of universal dominion, which the Orthodox Jew found in the law, the Pharisees did not interpret in the sense of the reign of the God of Moses over the nations, but in that of a material domination to be imposed on the universe by the Jews. The awaited Messiah was no longer the redeemer of original sin, a spiritual victor who would lead the world. It was a temporal king, bloody with battle, who would make Israel master of the world and drag all peoples under the wheels of his chariot. The Pharisees did not ask this enslavement of the nations of a mystical Jehovah, which they continued worshipping in public, only as a concession to popular opinion, for they expected its eventual consummation to be achieved by the secular patience of Israel and the use of human means. In other words, they would bring it about bring it about themselves through their bloodlust, serving their God, Satan. It was, as in, it was in this realm that the Talmud, comprising the writings of the rabbis, was cradled. The fundamental likeness of the Talmud and the protocols is most significant. Israel has been cursed for centuries with the false messianic ideal that she is entitled to rule the world. It would be ridiculous for anyone to say that powerful apostate Jewish leaders have no desire to attain race supremacy. Such an assertion would be contrary to every basic tenet of the Talmud. No doubt the great rank and file of Jews are ignorant of the subversive schemes which their leaders have set in motion at the top of Jewry. But when David sinned, the whole house of Israel suffered. A few quotations from the Talmud will suffice to show the true nature of its contents. Quote, you ask human beings, but the nations of the world are not human, but beasts. On the house of the Goy, one looks as on the fold of cattle. When one sees houses of the goy, one says, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud. And when one sees them destroyed, he says, the Lord God of vengeance has revealed himself. A Jew may rob a goy, he may cheat him over a bill which should not be perceived by him, otherwise the name of God would become dishonoured. The son of Noah who would steal a farthing ought to be put to death. But an Israelite is allowed to do injury to a goy. Where it is written, thou shalt not do injury to thy neighbour, is not said, thou shalt not do injury to a goy. I wanted to note there the son of Noah, that is the white race. It's all about the sons of Noah. Noah was fair-skinned, blue-eyed, brilliant, blazing blue eyes. It is described that when he was born, his eyes shone like the sun and he was advanced like Yahweh in his, uh, from the moment of his birth. So there is the distinction, it's about the sons of Noah, the white race. This is what the Talmud is about, coming against and obliterating 
the white race, as Adam has been alerting you to for the longest time. I'll continue. You've all heard about the Talmud before. You can find them easily now during the Google search. Um, now, the Talmudic, Talmudic writings growing out of a mixture of Babylonian paganism and Old Testament teachings were responsible for the spiritual blindness of the Jewish leaders in the days of Jesus. Hence his words recorded in Matthew 15, 6, quote, Ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Secret societies, occult in nature and tainted with the moral pollution of Babylon, grew up among the ancient Jews. These poison nerve centres became dotted throughout the nation. They were eventually enlarged into a system of invisible government which became known as the Kahal. This sinister organisation was responsible for fomenting the revolt against the Romans under Hadrian that resulted in the dispersion of the Jews in the year 135 AD. But far from destroying the Kahal, the scattering of the race only intensified its activity and increased its power by broadening its scope. Now, instead of having a single organisation concentrated in one place, the Kahal had expanded into small units scattered over all parts of the civilised world. It became the international underground organisation which bound Jews everywhere into an organic whole. So you see this ancient plan by the devil in men, the Jews, from the year 135 AD through their dispersion over the planet. And Kahal, so close to the word Kabal, which is used to describe the Bush family and all of their cohorts who are cohorts who are crypto Jews. We learn on good authority wherever Jewish emigrants settled, they founded communities apart under the direction of the fraternities and held to the precepts of the Talmud. Each community had its representative, its rabbi, its synagogue. It was a miniature kalhal. The different aims of these communities always found themselves intimately related with those of the central body which their ex existence depended. Quote, For if the ruling clique or caste had begun by grinding down on its own race, it now saw that by drafting them into its organisation, it could exploit the Gentiles on a far grander scale. The number of fraternities was increased by the addition of trade unions, every trade in which the Jews engaged being represented. To strengthen its control and to advance the interest of the Jews at a, as a whole, it developed and perfected that system of espionage which it still maintains. And of course, that is what the Israelis are all about, espionage. The Mossad black op operations in certainly modern times, since the bombing of the King David Hotel in July of 1946, 91 British soldiers killed. That was a Mossad black op to pit Britain against the Arabs, the poor, hapless Palestinians. And it has certainly worked until these days now where the world is awakening to who it is that is the enemy of all mankind. Thus, in every locality where a kahal existed, there was always a state within a state, each local unit shrouded itself in secret mysticism. An international system of Jewish occultism was thereby created. By this means, it has been possible to bore under Christian and Gentile foundations. Outstanding individual Jews have always worked their way into positions of power and influence. Napoleon once asked, once asked by what miracle did whole provinces of France become heavily mortgaged to the Jews when there are only 60,000 of them in the country? 
that the Jewish leaders scattered over the earth have maintained ways and means of communication and have worked together through the centuries is a fact that no informed person will take the trouble to deny. By this means, a worldwide program of secret government based upon the Talmud has been kept intact with some of the mightiest leaders apparently hidden from the public view entirely. And of course, today we refer to it as the hidden hand, which Yahweh has been alerting the world to for decades. Checking the time on this one. Now the next part called the Awakening. In the year 1897, the first Zionist Congress convened in Basel, Switzerland. This event is generally credited with being the pivot on which the rebirth of Jewish nationalism turned. Theodor Herzl, a Hungarian Jew, was elected president of the organisation, a position which he held until the time of his death. The rebirth of international Jewry did not occur in a day. Years were required to work up the interest and mould the sentiment which was expressed on that occasion. Prior to this gathering, there had been years of planning. Jewish leaders in different parts of the world had conceived simultaneously the plan of uniting their dispersed nation into one solid mass. No doubt such a Herculean task involved the exchange of many letters and several personal conversations through the channels of the international kahal. The men who were directing this undertaking were figures of outstanding prominence in the political, economic and religious circles of the world. It was not an easy task to pull the loose ends of the scattered nation together and breathe new life into its organism. After years of preparation, finally a great quickening took place and Zionism was born. So this is what Adam has been saying in his um, lectures, if you like, that Zionism is a recent event and this is what Hitler knew. It's uh, Judaism. It's always been about the abomination which makes desolate, called Judaism. Zionism is another ism created to be the tale, if you like, on the elephant in the room called Judaism. Would it be a misuse of words to designate men who were capable of performing such a feat as wise men? Would it be erroneous to call the written records of their deliberations protocols? Would it be wrong to refer to their finished plans as the protocols of the wise men of Zion? That such a group of international Jews did actually collaborate over a period of years in planning the rebirth of the nation is a well-attested fact that some of them were actuated by sinister motives is evident that the spirit of the Talmud and the occultism of the Kahal were manifested is equally evident. Now I want to just have a word here myself about the Christians, the deluded Christians supporting Israel crapping on about prophecies that they read into from Isaiah talking about Israel becoming a nation in one day and they look to that day as being May the 15th in 1948 where it was declared that Israel would be named Israel and that land known as Israel today belonging to the Palestinians was stolen to them so the deluded of the Christian world crap on about you see this is prophecy fulfilled well here it is plainly telling you that this took years, decades. It's a very long and ancient plan and it didn't happen in one 
day at all. That date in time was just a marker as the, um, they see it as the victory of their many years, decades, their ancient plan coming into fruition. Looking toward the West, we discover that powerful Jewish movements had been established over a period of years in both the United States and the countries of Europe. Nathan Birnbaum, the man who created the name Zionism, had formed an organisation called the Kadimah with headquarters in Vienna. Its avowed aim was to build a Jewish centre in Palestine from which the world should be ruled through the three spheres of politics, economics and religion. According to his plan, members of the race were to be planted in every nation for the purpose of determining the policies of the nations. A similar movement had taken form in Russia with its base in Odessa under the leadership of a vicious fanatic by the name of Asher Ginsberg. He founded his order in 1889 and called it the Sons of Moses. Ginsberg also used the name Ahadam and was known among his intimate followers as the King of the Jews. These are the kind of men who blended their efforts for the purpose of building their people into a united body. As previously indicated, their advanced preparations could be legitimately called protocols since the dictionary of this word is the preliminary sketch or draft of an official document. Strange thing about the whole matter is not such documents as the protocols of the wise men of Zion should have been written, the miracle is that they should have ever reached the public eye. But frequently in history we find that plans have miscarried or providences have occurred in which carefully hidden and secret schemes have leaked out. Indeed, there is a quote from the Bible that talks about nothing that is hidden will remain that way. An instance of this kind occurred in the year 1785 when a man by the name of Jacob Lang was struck dead by lightning while walking with Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Illuminati. When Lang's body was being prepared for burial, certain incriminating papers were found in his clothing which gave away many vital secrets of the organisation. As a result, the property of the Illuminati was confiscated by the Bavarian government and a ban was placed upon its activities. Many people who attach importance to the protocols regard it as nothing short of miraculous that these documents should have ever been made available to the general public. At different times in Jewish history, other protocols have been issued by leaders, as in the year 1492, when Chemor, chief rabbi of Spain, wrote for advice to the Grand Sanhedrin located in Constantinople. He received the following instructions, which may truly be called a 15th century protocol. Quoting beloved brethren in Moses, we have received your letter in which you tell us of the anxieties and misfortunes which you are enduring. We are pierced by as great pain to hear it as yourselves. The advice of the grand satraps and rabbis is the following. It's interesting to note that Andrea Anna has uh, shared a photograph from 1490. The, you've been hearing me refer to the dude that everybody is worshipping in Christianity is the image of the beast. It is not Jesus at all. As a matter of fact, it's, um, it's the son of a beast at the time. His image is the one that people share as being the image of Jesus. It is indeed the image of the beast. And Anna, I'll put the link to the photograph and the blurb about this dude from 1490. 
Okay, so the advice of the grand satraps and rabbis is the following. One, as for what you say that the king of Spain obliges you to become Christian, do it, since you cannot do otherwise. Two, as for what you say about the command to despoil you of your property, make your sons merchants that they may despoil, little by little, the Christians of theirs. And when they're talking about Christians, they're talking about Roman Catholics. Three, as for what you say about making attempts on your lives, make your sons doctors and apothecaries, that they may take away Christians' lives. Is this not what has been happening in this modern century? They are the doctors and the pharmacists. They're killing you by prescription drugs, all based upon benzoin or oil. Petrol, gas, you can thank Rockefeller, Standard Oil. And of course, Rockefellers are just another branch of the Rothschilds, the Jews. As for what you say of their destroying your synagogues, make your sons canons and clerics in order that they may destroy their churches. And this is what has happened to the Roman Catholic Church. It has been infiltrated by the devil, has been for centuries because it is the church that the Christ has been reborn into. It is his bride. So the devil has to destroy what belongs to God. As for what you, as for the many other vexations you complain of, arrange that your sons become advocates and lawyers and see that they always mix in affairs of state and that by putting Christians under your yoke, you may dominate the world and be avenged on them. So this is 1492. So how many lawyers are there around the world? How many policies, procedures, statutes, codes, etc., 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 have been established under maritime law? I think at one point it was touted at 60 million. That's what rules your life. The Jews, who call themselves Jews and are not. Do not swerve from this order that we give you because you will find by experience that, humiliated as you are, you will reach the actuality of power. Signed, Prince of the Jews of Constantinople. See, Jesus was and is an Essene. He is not a Jew. They are the sons of Cain. Seed of Cain. They are of their father, the devil. And it's well known amongst the Jews, touted by Harold, what's his name? Rosenthal? Rosenthal. Mm. But that's one of the five great big lies outside of the Holocaust. The first lie is that Jesus is a Jew. They know he's not. And the second one is the Holocaust. Like, big deal in his mind. So what? It's all about reparations. Money, money, money. Money is the root of all evil. It's their God. So going on about Ginsburg, European authorities who have made a careful study of the protocols of the wise men of Zion regard them as being more the product of Asher Ginsburg's brain than any other one individual. He is believed to have put more into them than others who may have collaborated in their construction because the fierceness and general language employed seems to reflect his intelligence and vocabulary. Moreover, they coincide with the plans and purposes of his order, the Sons of Moses. He is believed to have been more nearly the dominating figure of international Jewry than any other leader during the formative years when plans were being evolved for launching worldwide Zionism in 1897. Parenthetically, it is important to remind ourselves that Lenin and Trotsky 
attended these early Zionist gatherings. An important reference to Ginsburg appears in Colonel E. N. Sanctuary's book, Are These Things So? Quoting, when the World War broke out, it was soon discovered that there were many persons living in various European cities on American passports who had no right to those passports whatsoever, says Colonel Sanctuary. This condition created difficult problems for American consuls abroad to handle. In Ginsburg's Russian community, there were a number of genuine Americans residing in his city who had every right and privilege of registering in the consul's foreign office as Americans. And moreover, they had done so. But the police records of that city showed a much longer list of self-styled Americans who had never registered, and by that he's referring to the Jews. The faithful consul culled together the names of many of the so-called Americans who were evidently without passports and wrote the State Department in Washington saying that he was ready to clean the matter up if so authorised. Quoting, For reasons not then apparent, the Department had no enthusiasm in correcting this unfortunate situation. But the consul proceeded to perform his obvious duty anyway. He wrote to each person asking them to call at his office with their passports to be registered as true American citizens, but received no reply. A second letter was sent to everyone, and it was likewise treated with indifference. By this time it was evident that these people would yield to nothing but force, so force they should have. A third letter was sent to them telling them that in case of further disregard of the invitation, the local police would be asked to take up their passports. That brought everyone in haste to the consul's office, and lo, they were all members of the chosen or privileged race, the Jews. A few days later, the faithful consul received a severe reprimand from Washington for having thus performed his normal duty, and a few weeks later his resignation was demanded. Colonel Sanctuary arrives at the conclusion that Ginsburg in faraway Russia must have had tremendous secret strength with the United States government. Later, during the revolution when Russia was pillaged, few towns were so torn as Odessa, the home of Ginsburg and the headquarters of the Sons of Moses. Among other things, a Christian orphanage was destroyed and all the children shot to death. The Jewish leader, Deutsch, head of the Soviet police, organized the rape of women. He brought in brutal Chinese and other foreigners, formed them into bands and turned them loose like savage beasts to literally devour the Gentile women and girls of the locality. This horrible experience has been correctly termed an orgy of hell. For his services, the Moscow dictatorship decorated Deutsch with the order of the red flag, and this is what has been occurring in the Ukraine. Whether Ginsburg or someone else drafted the protocols, their contents show that tremendous intellectual powers were behind their preparation. These documents reach into the very depth of economic, political and international affairs. They purport to reveal an attack upon the Gentile nations, which, if not counteracted by some opposing force, will ultimately deliver the entire world into the hands of a small group of conspirators who will put into action the perverted messianic complex which now controls Russia through the medium of Jewish communism. At any, and the next um, subgroup is Nihilus. And I've gone way over time and my voice is about to run out. I'll stop there and continue later. <laughs> yes, I will. 
Later Gators. <laughs> I'm squeezing two shows out of this. Let's uh, go again. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't do it. I can't go. How much time have you got left to go for two shows? Another 55 minutes. Oh, oh you're still recording. I'm still recording. I don't recording. want the listeners to hear that uh, you don't get any dinner until you do your, your workload. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody's getting any dinner. <laughs> and it is that time, There we it? go. We've got it all on. Okay. All right. Oh, good. Well, no, I'm still recording, so it's going off now. Goodbye. <laughs>